Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Performance Virtual Chapter meeting. We're uh, doing something a little bit different this month. Uh, Microsoft has uh, uh, graciously done a series of things leading up to the launch of SQL Server 2014. So we're happy to host the sixth one in the series today. Um, I do want to thank PASS, Professional Association SQL Server and Microsoft for uh, collaborating and getting together to present um, all these sessions and series for uh, everybody in the SQL community. So a little bit about PASS for those of you that aren't familiar. It's the Professional Association of SQL Server. It's a not-for-profit organization that's run by the community. And the goal of PASS is to uh, connect everyone that's a professional in SQL Server together so they can kind of network, they can share the knowledge and things that they've learned, and they're also dedicated to the learning and teaching of uh, SQL Server professionals. And there's several different ways that you can take advantage of that. Um, we encourage you to go out to sqlpass.org and register. Uh, you don't get spammed, you don't get tons of email, anything like that. All the content you get is, uh, I guarantee, is fantastic content. And they provide this through virtual chapters, which of course you're here today with the performance virtual chapter. But there's a lot of different virtual chapters for just about anything that you can imagine. Uh, so make sure you go out there and check out all the other chapters as well. There's also physical chapters. Um, located all over the world. So no matter where you live, look and see if there may be a chapter that you can go um, meet face-to-face -face with some professionals in your area. We also do um, a couple of um, conferences. So the first one is the PASS Summit, and the PASS Summit will be in November this year uh, back in Seattle. So if you wanted to uh, hit one of the larger conferences, there's nothing like it in existence. It's fantastic. Uh, they also have the business analytics. Let me, um, this is a good time to try and find a pen and a piece of paper. No, it's not that bad. You can hit um, our website, but this is the business analytics conference coming up in San Jose in May. So if you're a data scientist, you're, you're into the business analytics side of things, uh, this is definitely the conference for you. But what you'll notice is in the right top right hand corner, we've got a code up there, the BAVC17. That code will save you $150 off your registration. So make sure you keep that code handy. Don't worry if you hit performance.sqlpass.org, our website, it's there so you don't, you can't find a pen, that's fine. But I want everybody to be aware of that. Uh, our chief chapter meets on every fourth Wednesday of every month. Um, if you are looking to get more involved with the chapter, we are on Twitter. Uh, SQL Pass underscore PVC is the account that we use if you want to go follow us out there. Usually during meetings, if you have questions, you want to chat back and forth, we use the hashtag of PassPVC. Uh, most of you probably found us. You know our website, performance.sqlpass.org. We also have a discussion group. So out of Google Groups, we have a, a free open to everyone discussion group. So if you have a performance-related question, you can shoot an email out to that group and you'll get a response back from other professionals. So it's a very handy tool to, to, to have. So I encourage you to take advantage of that if you can. And of course, if you ever have any questions about the chapter itself, you can always email the leadership here at performancesequelpass.org. So just as a few reminders for our presentation today, uh, all of the audio is provided through your computer speakers, headset, that type of thing. There is no dial-in number that you can use uh, for today's meeting. Uh, we do ask that you mute your microphone. You are muted in the software by default. However, just in case somebody gets unmuted accidentally, we prefer that um, if you do have a piece of hardware with a mute button that you go ahead and uh, hit the mute button there. You'll also notice in your GoToWebinar panel that there is a Q&A. So if you have questions um, as we're going through the presentation, feel free to go ahead and put your questions in there. If it's something that one of the panelists can answer, we'll go ahead and answer that for you. Otherwise, We'll ask our presenter either at the end or if there's a good uh, interruption point, we'll throw some questions out as well. So today we have Kevin Liu from Microsoft that will be speaking to us and talking about breakthrough data platform performance. Um, with that, Kevin, I'm going to switch the presenter over to you and let you introduce yourself and get started. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, great. So my name is Kevin Liu, and I'm the principal lead PM manager for uh, uh, for the uh, SQL Server Engine space. 
I have been with Microsoft SQL Server for uh, about eight years, and I have been involved in uh, in-memory OTP project since about uh, three years ago when it transitioned into the product group. So today uh, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, SQL 14 uh, in-memory technologies, and this is actually the the uh, the primary uh, value prop for SQL 2014. And uh, I will cover more than just the OTP area. Um, uh, in, altogether, uh, I have a roughly 30 to 35 slides I want to go through. Um, I know that I only have a, a you know, by now a 55 minute slot and allocating some time for Q&A. So it's going to be a pretty packed session. Uh, and also I have two demos. So I will run through the slide a little bit fast and only highlight the uh, the key ideas on each slide without reading through. I assume the uh, Ryan will distribute the uh, the slides afterwards so you can have an ample time to go through in detail. Yeah, if you'll send those to us, we'll get those posted, absolutely. Okay, great. All right, let me get started. So first I want to step back a little bit, just look at SQL 2014 all up. So you can see uh, in-memory technology is one of the four pillars, but it's the largest pillar. So just to remind you what the other SQL 2014 investments are, so there is indeed um, you know, additional uh, fit and finish work we did on Always On, which is the pillar for 2012, if you remember. And also we emphasized very strongly on the hybrid solutions that is how to tie to the Azure cloud. You know, how do you send backups there? How do you send always on, you know, HA secondaries over there, etc. right? And uh, lastly, we have additional investments on top of Windows Server, such as supporting reliable file system, REFS. Um, but those are uh, additional pillars. But let me come back to the, uh, the in-memory space. So in-memory space, we have three areas of improvement in OLTP, DW, and a very generic uh, buffer pool extension. So let me highlight on that. Um, the differences between those technologies is that uh, you remember OLTP really focus on, as the name says, OLTP workloads. That is very heavily concurrent data entry, data update, DML type of workloads. And uh, this is a new engine it's, you know, there are some, uh, you know, not everything supported in SQL today is supported here. So there are some limitations we'll talk to. And uh, then the second area is in-memory data warehousing. And uh, again, the work pattern is actually very different here. The, it's a it's data uh, decision support system type of queries. You usually don't do point lookups or, uh, you know, uh, single point updates. But instead, you do a very large aggregation and scans. And the last one, SSD buffer pool extension, applies to all TP workloads, but it's more based on the traditional all TP workloads, not the real time aspect of all TP, uh, where you have a very uh, tight uh, memory bound. You don't have enough physical memory for the buffer pool, and this is a cost effective way of increasing that performance. And um, you know, right now uh, for this presentation. I think maybe 70 to 75 percent of the time I will spend, I will spend on in-memory OTP, about 20 percent on DW, and I have a demo for each one. And SSD buffer pool extension, the concept is very simple, and if we have time, we'll maybe spend uh, a couple minutes in the end to cover this, otherwise I think you can just race through the slide and get uh, to understand this pretty easily. So let's start the in-memory OTP portion, talk about why. Uh, so there is a market angle for needing this, right? People always want to have a higher throughput, but the other thing I want to highlight is indeed people want lower latency as well. So when we talk about performance, it's not only throughput, but also end-to-end -end latency. And uh, of course, people are usually cost sensitive, right? Not only the hardware cost, appliance, or uh, anything related to that, but also the application rewrites, do I need to re-implement you know, the, uh, the uh, application on a different uh, surface area, all those kind of things. Uh, hardware trends is actually another thing that's driving the uh, OTP engine evolution here. So this one may not be very apparent um, you know, when you think about why we do this. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, if I remind you that the the uh, SQL 2012, let's take the SQL 2012 engine, the foundation for that was really laid down in 6.5, which is almost 15 years ago. So uh, 2014 is actually the first large-scale engine rewrites we're doing uh, in the past 15 years. Um, and the hardware has changed fundamentally. That's one of the very fundamental reasons why we're rewriting the engine from ground up. So in essence, what in memory OTP is, uh, which you also heard the name hackathon, which is really a Greek word for 100, right? Um, so the in memory OTP is all about performance to start with. It's not a feature on functionality. And uh, it's memory optimized, as the name indicates. And it's built into SQL Server, which may seem to be a trivial statement at this stage. But I will highlight why that's important. And also, it causes a lot of internal challenges in the implementation as well. Hopefully, you'll appreciate that a little bit more uh, when I discuss the details. The last one is what we just talked about, modern hardware trends is driver. So let's uh, look at the modern hardware trends very quickly to highlight uh, what's, uh, what's the driver. So the, if you focus on the lower right corner here, um, memory pricing coming down. By the way, the y-axis is logarithmic, right? So the price literally went from 1990, almost $100,000 per gigabyte, going down to about roughly 10 to $20, depending on the dim size today. So a drastic uh, change has happened in the memory space. Of course, this is the foundation for the, for the work. But there are two more aspects that's not very uh, apparent. Uh, one is the CPU clock rate has stalled. So if you look at the blue line I'm highlighting here, sorry, uh, the blue line I'm highlighting here, the CPU clock rate has stalled since about uh, 2003. As you have noticed that uh, the CPU clock rate has stalled around 3 gigahertz, even though they can achieve higher clock rate in the lab, but commercially it's no longer uh, easy to produce at higher clock rate due to heat issues and all sorts of other problems. So you have a plateaued CPU clock rate, which is actually a great challenge for us. Before, if we don't do anything, we simply write on the new hardware, the benchmark number always goes higher, right? But now you don't have that free launch anymore. But the other aspect that's really important is the new hardware uh, usually comes with very high number of core counts. So that forces us to make sure that the engine workload itself is able to scale freely as you have more cores, right? Um, so this is a something that's built into SQL today. That's not a, a uh, something we're going against, right? But it's not leveraged to, leveraged to the degree that we can write the scaling factor without any friction. So there are a lot of engine work that has been done to leverage those two aspects. One is actually a negative uh, factor, CPU clock rate stalled. The other one is a positive factor. There are more cores. How do we leverage that freely or f without friction? So this is a very busy slide. I will not read through all the details. Um, there are four pillars here, as you can see. And uh, the way to read this is from the bottom up. So the bottom layer is what's the driver? Why are we doing certain things in the design, core engine design? And uh, then you go up to the top, that's what the customers get uh, out, out of the engine design. And then let's go through the pillar by pillar. I will just uh, you know, ha you know, kind of focus on one or two facts on each one, uh, just give you a sense of what we are we're doing here. So the first one is, of course, the memory is readily available. And uh, it's a mid-range server you can easily buy today with a very uh, reasonable amount of money. For example, um, let's say um, a uh, two-socket, 16-core, um, physical core, and half a terabyte memory. That's actually not expensive at all. And, uh, and then if memory is that much available, if you look at the current design of SQL Server, you have a page concept, right, 8K pages. The only reason you confine the data to a page is solely because 8K is somehow an efficient container to transfer data to and from the disk, right? Because the disk is not a byte addressable space. It's a, it's a block addressable space, right? So you have this block concept for transferring efficiency to and from I.O. But if you, you want to design a, a data processing system that's really efficient in memory, you will never design that within an 8K boundary for the data container. But instead, you will design a hash table, for example. And then that's very effective for data processing, uh, but not 
as efficient for I/O transfer because that's a secondary consideration. So indeed, that's the that's the design principle for the first pillar. That we want to design high performance data operation, optimized for memory, not disk. Right? Um, that's actually the easy part. If you say, hey, everybody here knows how to design a hash table in memory. Well, that's the easy part. But how do you provide full asset capability on top of that? Let me remind you of the asset, right? Which is the atomicity, isolation, consistency, and durability, which is the important database characteristics. How do you provide those things on, in the in the system, and also provide a queryable, you know, entity relationship um, modeling language on top of it, right? That's the hard part. That's essentially what we have been doing. So in essence, I would summarize the first column as have the performance like a cache, but the capability like a relational database. OK, let's move on to the second uh, pillar. So the second pillar is about, well, the CPU really is not going up any further at this stage. Um, what do we do? Well, for this, I have to step back a little bit. For people who don't understand the SQL Server uh, engine internals, um, you all have been playing with, uh, uh, you know, for example, query optimizer. You have been looking at the, the uh, query plan. So in a way, you can logically map that to a uh, query execution engine mode that we actually have those operators at different stages to push the data up, so to speak, up the tree, right? But each operator is a, uh, it's a module which is being interpreted by the query execution engine. So in a way, this is very similar to a byte code you know, uh, interpretation in Java, if you like, uh, before. Um, so we, we actually don't execute at the, uh, you know, the machine speed but we're interpreting at the mission speed. There is a big difference. So this is needed because the query execution tree is very complex when you have a mixed mode of uh, very broad SQL surface error to support for OLTP and DW, etc. But in the OLTP space, we actually throw that concept away. We're saying, well, why do we need to go through an interpretation-based query execution engine? But instead, let's compile them natively and have a natively compiled query execution engine run at native binary speed. So essentially, that's what we're doing. So we don't have any another layer of uh, inefficiency. So just give you a quick idea on some of the uh, impact here. If you have a loop, let's say a loop without a payload, let's say a while loop, uh, you just loops through to do some uh, business function. In a traditional SQL Server, you do that loop versus a natively compiled store procedure doing that loop in, uh, in memory OTP, the difference is roughly 100-fold. That is, Hackathon is about 100 times more efficient than SQL in, in interpreting the loop business logic. Right? So let's move on to the third pillar. It's about high concurrency. Uh, the current SQL Server actually scales relatively well until you hit a bottleneck. So in general, SQL Server, um, if you don't do special partitioning or um, you know, data-dependent routing, uh, you just simply jam the data into the, the system, into a single table. Um, you can scale OK until, let's say, roughly 8 to 16 uh, threads. And then usually you get into negative scaling because of the contention gets very heavy. Uh, this is a well understood in uh, a common commonly known problem like uh, last page insert. And uh, there is really no simple way to get around it, right? It's a, it's a really page latch contention physically in memory. If you have a page you need to protect, you have a page latch conflict. But in Hackathon, not only we got rid of the page, but we also got rid of all the latching and, uh, and, and uh, locking concepts. So we use a optimistic concurrency control mechanism to uh, make sure that all the threads can run at maximum speed without blocking. And then uh, uh, at the end of the commit time, you resolve any conflict. So it doesn't mean there are two things I want to call out here. One is it doesn't mean there is no protection at the lower level. So indeed, at the very low, lowest level of the data updates, we have a uh, protection at the, at the native, natively Windows level. Uh, such as a interlocked compare exchange, right? So before we update any protected assets, we, we do have protection there. That's one thing to call out. And the protection is very efficient. I can just give you a sense of the speed. It's usually at the 10 to 20 
uh, CPU cycles to do that protected updates. But if you go through a latch or locking update, usually will take thousands or even tens of thousands of CPU cycles. The other aspect I want to call out is indeed you have potential write write conflict, right? So if you have two threads coming in and, and try to update the same column, uh, I mean the same row at the same time, logically, uh, indeed one of them will act, uh, will most likely fail if the other one commits uh, uh, or writes first. So um, so there is potential things you, you, you need to implement in the app tier to uh, make sure uh, you handle those kind of conflict situations. But the, the trade-off is you don't have locking, uh, you can uh, allow all threads to run as maximum, uh, at maximum speed as, uh, as needed. So the last column is uh, integrated into SQL Server. Uh, in the next slide, I will show you uh, some internal uh, architecture diagram. It will become more clear what we mean by that. But uh, at a high level, don't have to learn a new language. It's built into SQL Server. Actually, as a matter of fact, when you install SQL Server uh, 2014, you don't even see a, uh, a uh, installation for eMemory OTP. It will just be installed automatically. And you have the familiar concepts for SSMS and HA backup restore all should work orthogonally. So in this slide, I want to show you the internals of how this works. And uh, what you see right now is a, a SQL Server uh, as in 2012. And I have uh, three tables as example with their indexes. So first, uh, Hackathon engine, in memory OTP engine, is inside SQL engine, but we use a different memory space. And also, we need a different checkpoint location because the I.O. patterns for checkpointing is completely different than SQL. Um, so assume you move two tables over to in-memory OTP. They will disappear from buffer pool and also from the traditional disk-based storage. And in addition, the indexes are not logged. Right? So this uh, resolves a lot of the logging overhead for, uh, for OTP uploads, uh, updates. In general, if you have a lot of indexes on the, uh, on the table, the update efficiency is impacted dramatically. So we actually don't suffer from, uh, from that in a large degree. And uh, how do you access those? So what we call a query interop. So this conceptually is you use the traditional query execution engine to access the storage layer, which is in the new engine. Right? It's a crossover concept. So you treat Hecton tables as if it's a regular SQL table without any difference. So I will show you in a demo how that's happening. So in this mode, you get some of the benefits, such as high-speed data access, no latch and locking tension, but you don't get native compilation right, for queries. So to achieve native compilation, you need to go through a natively compiled store procedure. We don't support ad hoc query native compilation yet, but you can do store procedure compilation. And then you can consider this as both the query execution engine and the storage engine are optimized. So you don't uh, even touch the right side of the, uh, the engine stack at all. Everything goes to the left side where you achieve maximum performance gains. The last thing I want to call out is you can declare a table as non-durable. In that case, all the disk or I.O. interaction disappears. So this is a truly a relational cache scenario where you can get a very high throughput uh, and very low latency without any I.O. overhead. So the core engine is, is optimized to a degree that a simple operation like uh, row update, insert, etc., is actually down to the level of such as uh, you know, 50 uh, microseconds. And it's a, it's a, you know, 20 to 40 times more efficient than the traditional disk-based engine. So when we compare performance, we're comparing really uh, apples to apples, right? We're not comparing to the SQL Server fetching from the disk, but instead we're comparing to SQL Server already have the data fully warmed up in the cache in the in the buffer pool, and uh, that's the comparison we're saying 20 to 40 times more efficient. However, we have not. Uh, optimize the TDS layer. Just give you a sense, even in a uh, uh, named pipe connection, a TDS layer round trip can take up to 300 micros, uh, uh, microseconds. And we have not optimized for the IO layer yet. So this is something actually more in the domain of the physical hardware. 
uh, a disk, uh, you know, spin and disk media uh, round trip is usually five milliseconds. Even for SSD, it's usually about one millisecond. So, so that's a uh, if you already have a log bottleneck, most likely you will still suffer from that. Um, but I want to call out one thing: is the checkpoints I/O patterns are very different. We only do sequential I/O. There is no random I/O anymore for the for the uh, memory optimized table file group. Okay, so some early customer performance gains we have observed. Um, if you have the best fit uh, situation, that is, you really design the application for the memory OTP, um, you can get you know 25 or even more performance gains. Uh, we actually have one customer getting 36x. That's the highest number we have observed so far. Um, but if you are you know have a lot of I/O possibly in the system, the number goes down a little bit. And then um, the bottom one is if you take a benchmark like TPCC, we derive the workload from it. And this is heavily optimized for SQL. And it's very, uh, actually, it's very inefficient from the OTP design perspective. We get roughly 2x on the low end. So you can see the spectrum of performance gain. So uh, some people try it very quickly. You may get something in between. But uh, you know, this is a very rich area that uh, you, we need to look, and uh, the more, in general, the principle is the more business processing, data processing you can push down to the database engine level, the more you can benefit from the uh, uh, in-memory OTP engine. So let me do a quick demo and show you the syntax as well, what you do to, uh, to use in-memory OTP. So here, let me delete the database uh, to start with empty uh, clean slate. So this is a syntax, for example, to create a, uh, uh, a general database. This has nothing to do with the memory database yet. To enable in-memory OLTP, all you need to do is to add a additional uh, a, a file group which uh, contains memory optimized data. So in this case, let me just do that. And this is a very generic operation. You can just put in a script for anything you need to do. And uh, let's use the database. So here I want to do a quick hackathon and non-hackathon comparison. Um, for the non-hackathon situation, let me just create a simple table of four columns, uh, non-clustered index, uh, and uh, create a store procedure which loops through to insert records. And I can insert one hundred thousand records. Let's see how long it takes. All right, just look at the counter on the lower right side here. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse. So it's uh, roughly 13 seconds to execute this to insert 100,000 rows. And you can do a, a quick select to verify and look at some of the records. We'll just leave it there uh, for now. So now let's look at the in-memory OLTP portion. So in-memory OLTP, um, the only thing that's different is, the primary thing that's different is the with memory optimized on. So if I don't specify durability of this table, by default, it's fully durable. That means it's fully logged and fully checkpointed, right? So the index is a little bit different. Uh, the, uh, I define, I happen to define a, uh, a uh, hash index, which you need to define the bucket count. Uh, the non-cluster index, which I will talk to you uh, later, which is a B tree index, uh, you don't have to specify any uh, parameters. So I have two indexes on this one, and I uh, uh, labeled this as memory optimized. I think I have executed this already. Okay, so now the store procedure, in order to be natively compiled, you can see the keyword with native compilation. There are some additional parameters, but they're very generic. So all they do is to heavily uh, optimize at compilation time. So we take a little bit more time to compile, but at runtime, it's very, very efficient. So let's build this store procedure. You will notice that store procedure creation takes a little bit longer. Right? As I said, the compilation is a little bit more expensive. But let's execute the uh, uh, the store procedure. This will be very quick. Just watch the little uh, uh, counter on the lower right side. Actually, it's already done. It takes a fraction of a second, right? So just to show you, uh, this table is actually uh, we have all the records, 
and you can select all the records. So when I select from this table, I'm just selecting as if it's a regular table. Right? I'm not putting any special uh, you know, markers to say this is a memory table. So everything is just like a regular table. This is a essentially interop mode. But you can see the store procedure inserts is going through a natively compilation mode. So I'm accessing both parts of the engine. Uh, either from the old query execution engine or from the new uh, query execution engine in this example. All right, so we're about halfway through. Uh, timing is good. So let me run through the rest of the uh, some of the um, uh, advanced concepts, but I will run through a little bit quicker. I won't read everything on the slide. So memory optimized data structure uh, is indeed a new data structure. There's no page concept. And everything is versioned, so there's never a in-place update. The indexes are um, are needed all to tie the rows together in memory, right? But the indexes are never logged, and they're never hardened on the disk. So they're only built uh, in memory on the, uh, as data is created or recovered uh, in memory during the crash recovery. So this is a very simple view of what the data actually looks like. There is a row header. The beginning timestamp and end timestamp is merely the versioning information to uh, demonstrate the visibility of this row uh, to a specific transaction. And then we allow in V1 eight indexes. So there is a one byte per index overhead towards the end of the header. And then it's just the payload of the, of the table, of the, uh, of the columns. So this is a, uh, a view of, you know, you have a hash index on name and how the rows are chained together through the hash index. And uh, um, the infinity for the end time step just, in, just indicates this table is current. Um, it's, it's not been deleted. And uh, if you have a transaction coming in at time step 99, let's say you start with that with a snapshot isolation level, uh, as, as a snapshot isolation level as the as the, uh, uh, as the uh, let's say, isolation level you specified. So you have a visibility of time step 99. And so, of course, you can see the 50, uh, time step 50 to infinity. So you can see John. You do update. And at the time 100, you do the update. Essentially, you will end time step the original record with 100 and start a new record, um, update him from Paris to Prague in this uh, location. There is no lock. You can see the versioning uh, changes along the way. And then you chain the records occur accordingly. If the earliest, the oldest transaction of the whole system, whole database, moves beyond 100, you would actually be able to collect the old record away because nobody will be able to see those old records anymore, right, in logical uh, fashion. So you can click uh, garbage collect those records uh, from memory. So this is a really important. You can see the lightweight nature of this work. So I want to highlight one more time the principle is that we want to perform like a cache, but have a database, a relational database functionality. So one of the a very strong competitor in this space, like HANA, I just want to call out they actually have a 16K pages. So it's almost like a DBCC pin page kind of a solution for them, for their in-memory uh, OLTP. And uh, uh, I, we just don't see how they work around the page latch and other uh, constrict, constrictions that uh, uh, that solution will fundamentally not be able to work around. So let me talk about uh, non-clustered index. So there are two types of indexes in Hackathon. One is the hash index, as I just showed you here. The other one is a range index. So hash index is great for point lookup. Right. Let's say you want to look up on a name. You simply do a one-step hash computation, and you end it up in the bucket, and you can find the record. Hopefully, if you don't have a heavy hash collision, you can find the record in one or two steps. And uh, range index, however, is great for range lookup. What if I want to look at a record uh, or records with a time range of you know, from yesterday until today, which can be 500 records. So hash index will not be able to do that without full table scan. But range index will be able to build this hash, I mean, the, uh, the uh, B tree on the hash index, key, I mean, the range index key, and allow you to do range scans very efficiently for that sub range. 
And uh, so consider range index as a way to do range scans very efficiently and hash index as a way to do point lookups very efficiently. If you're not sure, use range index as a fallback. Um, but if you are, you know, if you need both, let's say on the same columns, on the same column, you can actually specify overloading indexes. Let's say you specify a hash index on column A for point lookup. You can also specify a range index, which is non-clustering index, uh, syntax syntax-wise, on the uh, on the same column for very efficient range scans. Okay, so let's talk about memory a little bit. So Hecaton is indeed memory greedy. So what I'm trying to highlight here is if you uh, define the memory uh, optimized table and you keep inserting rows into it, Hecaton will not be able to spill out to disk. Um, it's not like a buffer pool that once you under memory pressure, I can spill out to disk. We cannot. The assumption is the data has to be in memory. So the pointer resolution to a row will never result in a page back from the uh, OS. That's the principle. So in that case, let's say as, a, as you grow the in-memory uh, table pressure, it will actually put pressure on the buffer pool eventually cause some problem. So what, what do we do? So here I'm just highlighting the point one more time. Data must be residing in memory all the time, but you do have an option to specify a resource governor, resource, uh, resource pool, especially the good practice is to uh, define a dedicated resource pool and tie that to the hackathon uh, uh, table, actually tie that to the specific database, um, and you can specify this is only for all TP work, uh, in memory all TP workloads, and uh, we have examples for that. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, uh, session is too short. I can't run you, uh, run you the demo, but this is something we, uh, you can easily find on books online how to do that. In that case, Hecaton will grow, but only to a certain size. So you will never be able to put pressure on the buffer pool side and put uh, unpredictable performance in the regular on disk based uh, B tree operation. So that's the solution. So quick calculation, how do you estimate the memory consumption? So this, I'm not going to go through here in detail, but there are very simple ways to, uh, to do the calculation. For example, the row overhead, header overhead is 24 bytes, and you, if you have an index structure you define, you can actually very precisely calculate how much memory you will need, and then you can you know, figure out how much physical memory you need, how do you define the, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, resource governance uh, pool size. So usually we, the guidance is to define 2x of the physical memory in the resource pool because of the row versioning, right? As I said, there is never in-place update. It's always create a new version. Even though the garbage collection is quite efficient, um, but assume there are some lagging between the row being out, outdated before it's being fully collected. So if you uh, uh, allocate roughly 2x, it's, it's pretty uh, safe there. So the rest, I'm going to talk about the uh, the uh, more from the DBA perspective very quickly on the uh, how do you achieve durability and what's the uh, consideration from the durability perspective. So um, right now, a time check. I will run through this section a little bit fast and maybe skip some of the uh, slides. I do want to allocate uh, 15 minutes for uh, column store. Um, so, uh, so bear with me. I'm going to run a bit fast here, but the slides will, you know, you will have to, uh, uh, you can go through them offline and, and send me questions if you have any. So the checkpoint file essentially is a data file and data file pairs. And we have multiple data files and multiple data files, and, and they are logically grouped in pairs, as I said. So the data files is essentially the payload, the, 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 uh, the uh, the data you have in the system. And the data files doesn't have the payload. It simply denotes those rows have been deleted, right? The way we do it uh, is that we actually don't do a memory dump. We don't scan through the memory to generate the checkpoint files, but only we scan the logs. And uh, the logs are kept in the log pool. They're still in memory. We're, we're scanning them before they go to the I.O. So it actually should not incur Turning through the I/O for the log to to generate the checkpoint. So the way it works is uh, I'm going to animate through this very quickly. There is an offline checkpoint thread. You scan the log, 
you just generate uh, the the uh, the deltas into uh, the deleted records into the delta and the inserted records into the data files. So essentially, that's logically how it's done, and uh, everything is date ranged, right? You, you, you know, specific date range goes into specific far, uh, file pairs. Okay. So now you can you can realize that you know as you delete, you almost like a Swiss cheese, right? Logically, you have a lot of holes in the data file that actually has already been deleted in the data file, but they just sit there in the disk. It's very inefficient. That's why we have a merge operation that uh, uh, goes through and essentially collects those uh, you know, um, data and the deletes and merge them together. Um, that's also how we get around uh, from doing uh, random IOs. We don't do random IO because we only do a pens, uh, sequential IO, and occasionally we'll do this one sweep, in this case, uh, to merge the files to get rid of the inefficiency. So in this case, let's see, you see range 200 to 300, you have almost everything, uh, more than 60% is already deleted, and about 40% of the range 300 to 400 are already deleted, right? So the storage is not very efficient. So in this case, we will logically read through them and, uh, uh, and do the merge operation. So we combine the range of 2 to 400 and get rid of each individual range, and you have a much smaller disk footprint um, afterwards. And also, this is more efficient for the uh, recovery process as well. Okay, so that's the end, uh, footprint for the uh, for the files, as you can see on the right side. All right, so um, so here I just want to call out the logging. Um, you still should think about uh, the log content is roughly the size of data change, right? We can't get around that. If you want to have durability, we have to log the changes. So that part is still there. However, I want to call out there is no, um, we don't do undos, so there is more efficiency compared to traditional SQL. And also, index operations are never logged, right? So it's only the table uh, itself is being logged. And recover mode, all three, simple, full, and bulk are fully supported. So this is a quick view of the how we do recovery. So recovery is actually quite efficient in the sense that we simply load the data files first as a filtered map, and then the data files are streamed through them, and then that's how we do the, uh, the uh, checkpoint recovery. Um, this we can do in a uh, concurrent parallel fashion, and uh, um, so essentially we'll leverage all the cores in your system. The bottleneck is usually the I.O., so it really boils down to how fast your I.O. is for the recovery. But I do want to call out very strongly that this is very different than SQL today. Uh, for on-disk based database, SQL, you may have a one terabyte uh, database, but recovery is lazy, right? Once you go through the end of the recovery, which may take only seconds, you open up the database for lazy uh, operation. So anything you read on that time, at that time will be fetched from the database. However, in-memory OLTP can, cannot do that. We actually have to recover all the in-memory data, fully in-memory, before we can open up the database. So indeed, RTO is impacted. But the way of thinking here is the I.O. is the bottleneck for recovery. Uh, on a very good I.O. system, you can roughly put the uh, uh, benchmark as roughly one gigabyte uh, per second recovery speed. So you should do some thinking here. Uh, it's not uh, a second uh, kind of recovery. If you have a large database, it could potentially take one or two more minutes to recover. So here I already highlighted before, what is a suitable app for in-memory OTP? In essence, if you use the database as a very dumb store, you do a single row uh, operation uh, from the mid-tier, the business logic is all in mid-tier, then it's very hard for the database engine to be efficient for you. But however, if you treat the database as a smarter engine and are able to push some of the business logic down to the LLTP or the database layer, then the database is very efficient for you, right? So that's the most important factor. And then I listed some other factors here as well. So that's essentially what I have for in-memory LLTP. I do want to talk about DW very quickly before we end this call. So in-memory DW uh, is already released in 2012 as a non-clustered uh, option, but you cannot update it, right, once you create it. 
Uh, in 2014, it's updatable, but let me step back a little bit, just give you the introduction on why this is a, a, a fantastic technology. So instead of storing stuff in a col in a row fashion, where you rotate everything by 90 degrees, uh, store them in a column fashion, this actually does wonders for both the data compression. So you know, uh, page and row compression, you can never achieve 90% compression. That is 10x of the data compression. But you can achieve that with column store because the the, uh, the data inside a column is highly homogeneous, right? And um, so compression is one very important aspect. And then, of course, the, the query processing for data decision support type of queries is very efficient as well. So usually people see 5 to 10x of improvements. So we talked about this is a physical transformation of the data. It's stored differently. And uh, this is a very quick example showing you why this, uh, the query is very efficient and compression rate is high. So this is a, a table, let's say, uh, we're using as example across uh, those columns. Um, first, what it does is do a, do a row group separation. So you have one million row groups, one million row uh, per row group. Uh, we call them a, 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 a you know, horizontal partitioning. And then you do vertical partitioning, separate the columns. Then you do heavy compression, and you can see uh, because the data is so homogeneous, the compression is actually very efficient as a result. And then, if you have a query like this, right, which is a aggregation across a range, we can do uh, column elimination because we never need those columns, and then we do segment elimination on top of that. So instead of forcing us to scan through um, the whole table. You can see now we only look at three segments in this example. Uh, uh, that's why the queries can be really efficient compared to traditional tables. Okay, so in 2014, you already have everything I talked about here in 2012. In 2014, it's updatable. The way it's done is we, we have a Delta store, which is actually a row store up front before the column store which is a staging area for data updates, for DMLs. And once they accumulate to a certain point, we'll do a top mover, convert them to the column store, and, and do the compression along the way. So that's how it works. And from logical perspective, you don't need to worry about where the data sits. So if you do a uh, select from the table, even though the data may be sitting in the Delta store, which is the role store, we'll give you a logically a uh, cohesive view across all the data set. So uh, you don't have to worry about where the data is. Right? That logically it will be always correct. So let me do a quick demo on the column store uh, uh, portion. Then we can open up for questions. Okay. So now uh, I'm using this database pre-existing and I have a CCI test table. And this table, I don't have any index to start with, but I have roughly 9.3 million rows. And uh, if I don't have any index, let's uh, do a, uh, a query, which is a, a uh, let me just show you what the columns look like. So those are the columns. And uh, essentially, I'm doing a uh, aggregation count and group by a date, right? Uh, this is a very non OLTP, actually it's a very DW type of query as you all noticed. So if I do this, and let's monitor the performance here. So um, you know, I, I, I checked all the, uh, the performance numbers before, so this is the, uh, the average I get. Uh, it's roughly three seconds for the CPU time, and the elapsed time is actually shorter. The reason is I have, on this uh, test machine, I have uh, eight cores. That's why the CPU time is higher than the elapsed time. And the table uh, takes about uh, half a uh, gigabyte of memory, okay? I mean, a uh, space, a uh, physical space on the, uh, on the table. And now, if I create a clustered index, traditional clustered index on this, and do the query again, uh, the performance is a little bit better, um, and the size is roughly the same. Um, and also, I did a uh, page compression on this before. It doesn't really do too much. It's about 30% uh, compression from page compression. Uh, that's how you can get. Uh, the index overhead is very small, as we expected. So, so now, let's get into um, uh, column store uh, 
in, in this case. So if I create a clustered column store index on this, okay, let me drop the uh, drop the uh, B tree index first. Create a clustered column index. It takes a little bit because this is a physical transformation, right? You know, this is actually where we do the compression, uh, create a segmentation, all those things. Now let's do the query. So there are a couple of things I want to call out. Not only the query, you can see the timestamp here, uh, the time execution, etc. Uh, this one is longer because I have the execution plan. So there are a couple of things I want to call out here. Why is the time compared to before is much, much faster. In this case, it's about seven times faster. And uh, even the elapsed time is, uh, you know, with less even CPU uh, parallelism, but the performance is much higher than 3x. Uh, the end-to-end -end time. Look at uh, not only this is faster, but look at the space usage. It's about 10x of compression, right? And also, I want to show you the plan. You can see the the batch operation. If you look right on the plan here, what I'm highlighting, I'm move, I'm showing here. You can see it's instead of row operation, you have a heavy batch operation. So this is a very different way of the query execution engine to process those kind of queries. It's actually way more efficient than row level operation because we push a, a, a very large section of the batch of rows together through the uh, query execution tree. So last one I want to highlight is uh, you can do inserts, right? So now you can do inserts. Let me do the uh, query um, and pop the newly updated records on the top. Let me remember 7284 is the aggregation. If I just run it one more time to prove this is indeed being updated. Um, so you can see the number is different. So this is a, uh, a column store index, but cluster column store index, but it's fully updatable, right? So that's the, uh, that's the new in SQL 2014. Well, that's all I have from material perspective. And in this uh, bottom of the slides, I have more details on uh, some customer data, uh, buffer pool extension, et cetera, but I don't think I want to cover them here since we're almost out of time. So let's leave a couple minutes for uh, Q and A. Uh, Ryan, uh, what's the what's the key questions you have so far? So I've only got a couple, um, but as usual, when we start the Q and A, that's when everybody usually throws some questions in. So, um, so back toward the beginning, we had somebody, and you may have covered this a little bit, but um, they were wondering if there was an algorithm that could be used to determine. Uh, how much storage would be used for the file group uh, when you're using memory optimized tables? Yes, yes. So uh, the file group, we have a uh, this slide for the memory calculation. And so ca you can roughly uh, multiply another 2x on top of the memory provisioning for the file group usage. The reason is uh, you have additional uh, data and data file inefficiency, right? I can call, you know, the data is a delete, but it's not been chewed up with the data uh, in a real-time fashion. So the merge process will eventually catch up, make sure the checkpoint file is roughly the in-memory data size, but that takes time. So if you allocate 2x, uh, which is really not a problem, right? You know, we're talking about 2x compared to memory size. Uh, that's what you should allocate for file group. Um, if uh, let's see, you were talking about resource governor, um, and they were wondering if that was going to be available in the standard edition of SQL 2014. Um, I don't think so. This is a uh, actually enterprise. Uh, uh, this hackathon is a purely enterprise feature uh, in this case. Okay. And I so don't think we're no. Yeah, it wouldn't matter at that point anyway, because you'd already have enterprise. Right. Um, can you use explicit transactions for DML statements using in-memory tables? Yes, yes. This is actually a quite a complex subject. Um, so this is where in the, um, uh, let me go back to my example here quickly. So, so if you notice in store procedure, I specified transaction isolation level is snapshot. And also when I did the interop query, 
to the uh, to the uh, uh, in-memory table. I didn't specify anything, but that's mapped automatically to uh, RCSI. So read committed snapshot isolation level. Um, you can specify them either explicitly or implicitly. But there is actually a little bit complication when you do a cross-container transaction like this. So what I'm doing here is indeed uh, cross you over from a, a SQL container into a Hecaton container. And you can join across them too, but there is a little bit complication. We're not going to discuss here. Um, uh, but in general, yes, you specify the uh, isolation level in the transaction. You can totally do that. Um, do you have a general idea on what is the overhead increased when updating a column store index table? The overhead of a update in column store index. So, good question. Um, it's actually not very high in the beginning because it's simply an insert into the row store in the front, right? Uh, however, the implementation currently is not um, factoring very heavy OLTP. So it's not designed for a heavy OLTP workload. But if you have inserts, usually it's fine. But if you do a lot of updates, uh, the locking will have some conflicts, potentially. Um, but if you just do inserts, um, the overhead is not very high. Um, then after it's become full, let's say the, uh, the segment become very full here, up to uh, 1 million rows, we will do the compression, which is what we have to do anyway for the uh, non-clustered uh, index, or the first time you build the CCI. So that's an operation we can do. Uh, pretty efficiently. Um, we had uh, somebody asking if you could continue to onto the buffer pool part, and if you could go over the Hecaton 8K row size explanation again. Oh, Hecaton 8K limitation. Okay. So Hecaton, let's separate those two topics. Let's talk about Hecaton 8K. Okay, Hecaton at runtime. Uh, we limit 8K. The reason is we there is no inherent reason to have 8K limitation, but we want to limit to 8K because then you can destage into B tree uh, easily, right? If we grow, let's say we define to be uh, 16K, you may have a hard time later on to destage the into B tree for compatibility reasons. Uh, but there is no inherent reason for Hecaton to limit that. So 8K is actually at the definition level as well because we, as I said, we actually heavily optimized at compile time. So if you define two var charts, each one is uh, 5,000, the table creation for that table will fail. But if you define, um, you know, uh, but the actual usage, let's say you, you define two of 4,000 var charts, it will succeed. It doesn't mean the memory usage will be 4,000 each. If you insert, let's say, three bytes, uh, I mean, uh, 30 bytes, let's say, um, you know, at runtime, we'll only claim uh, allocated 30 bytes for that role. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's efficient in runtime, but define time or definition time for the table DDL, uh, uh, it's a little bit more strict for compatibility reasons. So buffer pool extension, by the way, I want to highlight buffer pool extension does not work for in-memory OTP. It's a fake memory from our perspective. It's, uh, it's uh, efficient in the memory hierarchy more so than the spinning media, not, but not as efficient as real RAM. So this is not, I want to call it, it's not workable in the memory OT, OTP case. And uh, the idea for SSD buffer pool extension is very simple. It's to find SSDs or especially PCIe based SSDs as an intermediary in the memory hierarchy between RAM and physical st storage, right? So the idea is use non-volatile memory as an in-between stage to make your working set to be roughly the same size as the NVRAM here. So if you look at the, the portion I'm highlighting here, or moving my mouse around, it's essentially trying to increase your uh, NVRAM to be roughly the working size so that the, the pages, you will not be you know, fetching clean pages from the uh, from the disk, but instead you have this staging array for fast data retrieval. Uh, that's the idea. So quickly, um, you know, what's the performance gain you get? Uh, we have a uh, I you know let's say buffer pool constricted um, uh, example internally for testing. We can observe roughly three x when it's uh, buffer pool starved, 
uh, comparing to uh, with and without buffer pool extension. Um, another question was, can you combine in-memory native store procedure together with column store index in a data warehouse? No, you cannot, not in this stage. But this is something actually uh, we're, uh, we're working on. Maybe we'll do something creative down the road, but not at this stage. Does Hecaton support or process GPU acceleration? Uh, no, but we are looking at the GPU for DW scenarios for the Apollo case. Um, I think at this time, we're, um, that's all the questions that I have, and we're here at the top of the hour. So, um, Kevin, thank you so much for today, but uh, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up. Really appreciate you taking the time to come out here and present and, uh, and tell us uh, all the new stuff going on in 2014 in uh, Techathon. Thank you, everybody. You have been a wonderful audience. Thanks, Kevin. Bye.